So, we now come to the end of our conference, and this is the part where we present our Jerry B. Duvall Public Service Award, which I will attempt to pull out of the box here real quick. Look at that. Yeah, don't drop this crystal. There's the award. Now, as Rick mentioned a moment ago, we have named this award after our good friend and mentor, Dr. Jerry Duvall. Um, to give you a little bit of background about Jerry and why we uh, named the award after Jerry, Jer George and I met Jerry 18 years ago. We were young whippersnappers, staffers at the FCC in the now defunct competition division. And um, Jerry, a lot of people don't know this, but Jerry is probably one of the, has the greatest sources of institutional knowledge of telecom that I know. Um, he was one of the founding members of OPP back under Charlie Ferris. He was economic advisor to Commissioner Ann Jones in the 80s. He helped develop the groundbreaking paradigms at the time of competitive carrier and the computer inquiries. Uh, and he currently serves as the FCC's chief economist of the International Bureau and president of the FCC's band. But Jerry has an absolutely tremendous institutional knowledge. And George and I, being new to the business and relatively young, Jerry took us under his wing and basically sat us down and, and read us the riot act and told us how we should conduct ourselves as FCC staffers, that it was appropriate to do the commission's business with honor, credibility, integrity, rigor. Um, and I think that's an interest, and in, in, in it, in it stuck with us. I mean, I used to give Jerry a ride home every day. Uh, and it was this great, amazing sort of institutional learning of just explaining why things work in the business or why things are. And to be honest, Jerry really provided one of the main impetuses for the Phoenix Center. Uh, Jerry always believed, through all his years in the business, that there could be an organization out there that did rigorous, timely, policy-relevant work. Uh, Jerry likes to remind us, has, and always continues that there is, in fact, a market for staff and policymakers for good work. They actually do appreciate it, particularly in this current age of blogs and tweets, that serious analysis does play a role. Um, very often, you know, you get into a political fight, but it's very often the serious piece of work that will nudge an outcome one way or the other. And um, it's very nice to know that Jerry tells us that our work continues to be used. So we appreciate that very much. And that's why we decided to name our award after Jerry. So the award, a little bit about the award, is sort of the best way I would describe it as sort of a Profiles and Courage Award uh, for telecom policy. Um, we give it away on a bipartisan basis. Um, it, the actual inscription, um, if I can read it here, it's just, in recognition of the person is exercise of political courage in and contribution of analytical rigor to the United States telecoms policy debate. And what we've tried to do is identify folks that have really worked very hard on a principled way to make decision making in a very political business as not wrong as possible, um, is the best way to describe it, because you're never going to make things right. And that is a very, very difficult very difficult process. And the reason why we are giving it to Rob this year is that we can think of no better person who sort of epitomizes um, the standard of our award um, for this year. Rob is hard to believe, but the senior old man of the commission has been there since uh, one of your website, Rob, 2006. And he was reappointed by President Obama. And, and what's been remarkable at Rob, and I think credit really must be given him is that Rob has always been a, a sound principled voice, but very often, twice I guess, the, the, when the commission has not been at a full complement, it is Rob literally walking the lonely road trying to um, hold back the tide in what could have been a very bad outcome. And I think that is truly a remarkable um, contribution to the policy debate. You know, there, there are voices on both sides, but very often when you are the lone voice, that makes life even tougher. And Rob has stood strong. Um, now, keeping with my earlier comment that um, I like to provide a personal anecdote of all of our keynote speakers, what you don't know about Rob is that Rob's actually a really fun guy. Now, how do I know this? Because I actually went to Rome when 
was Rob McDowell. It turns out, this is a true story, that, um, oh, it must have been, I think it was like 2007, 2008, a friend of mine runs um, probably the only tiny telecom think tank, and he goes, do you know any of the FCC commissioners? I said, I think I can find one. So I ran into Rob and said, how'd you like to go to Rome in October? And Rob looked at me and goes, oh, twist my arm. So off, off we went, Angela went to, and this conference was nothing that I've ever seen in my life. It was like a mini Sistine Chapel. I mean, just high ceilings, frescoes, Michelangelo's. And, you know, I spoke and Rob spoke, and it was great, but vintage, you know, it was like the Dolce Vita, because the fact is the fact that we had a major U.S. policymaker there was completely irrelevant, because my friend had got the heads of the five families together, of all the heads of the Italian telecom, you know, companies, and it was like the paparazzi were all around them. So Rob and I were like, oh, that's great. But it was a wonderful time. Uh, and this is, I have pictures. It's great. So <laughs> it is true. It's a true story. So I remember eating Angel uh, uh, gelato with Angela. It was a great time. But again, we are delighted and honored to present our award um, for 2012 to our good friend, uh, Commissioner Rob McDowell. So Commissioner. <laughs> And again, our constant rule is we expect it to be deployed prominently in the office. There we go. So Rob has graciously agreed to, um, we'll get to the box, um, to have a bit of a Q&A with us. So let's move on over. So as I mentioned a moment ago in, in my, um, oops. Uh, who needs notes? a moment ago, you were born in 2006, and how have you seen the industry change over that time? I mean, that's a really remarkable time and to see and oversee the industry. How, how have you seen things change? First of all, before I answer the question, let me just say thank you very much for this award. Uh, it, it's very meaningful. It's very meaningful that it, uh, it comes in the name of this tremendous public servant, Dr. Duvall, sitting right here uh, very quietly in the front row, uh, and... Um, it's, I don't know what's more humbling, to be given the award or have the award named after you, Jerry. Uh, wh which is it? Uh, to still be living and have an award named after you. Uh, actually, it's even better, I'm sure. Uh, but what about whiskey? Oh, risky. I thought you said something about whiskey. Uh, sorry, it's the Irish ears that I have. Um, but uh, it is, I guess it's risky, but uh, you have to, there's a, a standard by which you have to now live. You can't you know, ever you know, go below that standard. Uh, and we don't expect you to. But no, thank you very much. Uh, it is, uh, it's, it's humbling and, uh, and very nice of you to, to do that. I'm, I'm very honored. Um, so on to your question. Uh, so uh, it's changed tremendously. I've been uh, at the commission a little over six and a half years. Uh, and and yeah, now being the most senior member of the commission, uh, that shows you how quick there is turnover, actually, uh, at the FCC. But um, you know, in 2006, June 1st of 2006, the number one social networking site was MySpace. Where's MySpace today? Uh, so that gives you just one sense. The, the iPhone hadn't been hadn't debuted. It debuted the same year as uh, my now five and a half year old, uh, uh, and uh, uh, he was using it literally before he could walk. Uh, and that's how much uh, uh, integrated into our lives uh, things like that have been. Um, I think it's more competitive. I think uh, consumers are more uh, awash in um, information. Uh, than ever before, and from more producers of information and through more conduits than ever before. Um, so I think it's uh, an exciting time to be a consumer. It can be a little exhausting trying to keep up with it all. Uh, anyone else going to go to uh, CES next week? Uh, I'll be there. Yeah, good. See you at the craps tables. Okay. Uh, and um, uh, but that's uh, you know another great example uh, to, to learn every year of, of, of new technologies coming over the horizon and, and how they're affecting. Uh, folks and, and really improving uh, the daily lives of every American. Um, so I, I think it's an exciting time. There's more competition than ever. And of course, there's more strain on the spectrum and uh, it, it creates public policy challenges. And uh, so that's uh, where Congress and the FCC come in. So um, as um, this is the business that never sleeps. Uh, from your perspective, what do you see are the top priorities that the commission should be focusing on 
um, and just as equally important, what are we making things priorities that we shouldn't be prioritizing and focusing on other things? So where do you, where do you see the big items for this upcoming year? Well, I think by far the number one item will be the incentive auctions, as the last panel uh, drilled down on uh, in, in depth. Um, and that may uh, have uh, indirect effect on a lot of other uh, topics as well. Um, so uh, not only uh, is it a good idea for us to be uh, focused on it, but it's the law, as the old saying goes. Uh, and so we, we absolutely have to be focused on them and, and make sure we get it right. I want to make sure we um, get it right and we can get it done as quickly as possible. But uh, if it's one thing that I've learned from either the AWS auctions of 2006 or 700 megahertz auction of uh, 2008, is that there will be surprises and this will probably take longer than expected. Um, and especially, as I've said before, especially because this will be the most complicated uh, spectrum auction in literally world history. Um, so uh, be prepared for the unexpected and be prepared for it to take uh, longer than you think. Um, so uh, some uh, of the other priorities may be determined by, you know, we're at the, uh, the point where the second term of the uh, Obama administration is just now getting going, and uh, so there may be new personalities uh, involved in the next four years, um, and uh, as well as in Congress. So some of those priorities might be influenced by those types of changes. So there, uh, is a, there are a lot of variables here on January the 3rd of 2013 uh, over the next four years. So uh, a lot of unknowns, um, but that's uh, number one. Uh, I, my concern, so back to your, the other part of your question, is some of my concerns is what, what happens uh, should uh, the D.C. Circuit uh, vacate the open Internet order? Um, and we have um, the Title II docket still open, and I've made no secret of my concern regarding that. Um, I, the, uh, the data roaming order uh, was handed down when I was in Dubai, and then we went into the holidays, and I'm still uh, digesting it. Um, but... Uh, I want to try to think of what the implications could be uh, there uh, on uh, uh, on uh, the D.C. Circuit as it uh, contemplates the, the net neutrality order. Um, but I think having that Title II docket open is um, harmful. Um, it's not the direction we want to go in. Uh, and unfortunately, if the commission were to try to go in that direction, even uh, with a skinny, so-called skinny Title II, I think that would unfortunately dovetail all too well with what's going on internationally. Uh, at the ITU and continue to uh, fuel those types of efforts to the point where it would be a, uh, a very short period of time before, for the most part, information services, the Internet in particular, would be regulated like a, uh, like a utility uh, internationally uh, as well as domestically. So uh, I, I'm concerned about that. I'm concerned about uh, where the Commission might go vis-a-vis uh, -vis the wireless sector. The wireless sector has been one of the crown jewels of the American economy since it was born. Uh, and we have uh, well over 90% of uh, American consumers having a choice of at least five wireless uh, carriers. We have tremendous opportunities in unlicensed as well as licensed coming forward. Um, and uh, I'm concerned that uh, there might be some needless regulation placed into the space, um, which could dampen investment and uh, start to curb uh, innovation and and therefore undermine the consumer consumers' experiences. Um, so, but a lot of this depends on who's running the show over the next four years and the personalities involved and their background and, and their philosophy. Um, having sat in your chair for as long as you have, you've seen a panoply of people come through your office and lobby you and you've read the pleadings. Speaking as a practitioner, what do you see as a way to make the FCC's process work better? Are there things that the Commission institutionally can do? Are there things as practitioners can do by raising the level of, you know, trying to, Hal had made a point earlier about, you know, actual, you know, filing comments and then having, you know, having to bear the cost of that as opposed to now where you just have a thousand emails being filed going, I don't like this rule. Then the Commission goes, look, it's the weight of the evidence. Um, how do you think we can make the process work better, make it less political, make it more substantive, which I realize is a difficult task, but <laughs> what do you think about that? So, you know, I think uh, the commission, uh, from the commission's perspective, it, it could do uh, a better job sometimes of uh, a jurisdictional analysis, uh, of explaining why it has authority in a, in a particular area. Um, uh, 
talked about for years now, the need to do uh, bona fide uh, market analyses, uh, cost-benefit analyses, uh, whenever we're considering a, a new rule, and not just lip service, uh, but uh, something that's weighty and meaty and, and substantive. Um, every regulation does have a cost, and sometimes they're absolutely necessary, but sometimes uh, the cost of the regulation outweighs uh, the uh, perceived uh, benefit or the contemplated benefit. Um, f f you know, advocates uh, think it's always helpful to g come with us with as much factual evidence as possible. Yeah, to me, the email campaigns or letter writing campaigns of people's opinion, that's uh, nice. It's uh, uh, important to understand that people are emotionally invested, but what we need are, are is, is hard data. Um, and so uh, I think, you know, for me, the special access debate has uh, been a good illustration of that. Obviously, I came from the SELEC the world before uh, uh, coming to the FCC. Uh, and from day one, uh, uh, the folks on both sides would come to me with their PowerPoints uh, showing uh, in you know discrete markets, uh, what their view of the world might be vis-a-vis -vis special access, uh, but as a, sort of an adjudicator, a policymaker, what I need is hard e evidence and lots of it, and comprehensive evidence. So that's why, for all these years now, I've been uh, advocating for a granular uh, record, um, which has been done before in uh, in uh, merger trend, you know, merger reviews by DOJ and such over the years, uh, the old Bell IXC uh, mergers. Uh, so. Uh, that's just one example of give us your, your, your facts. Tell us also what you think the most compelling argument is against your case and why it might be right or might, why it might be wrong. Uh, you know, statements against interest, uh, but with uh, good full explanations can actually go a long way, not just regarding your credibility as uh, an advocate, uh, but also helping us understand the fuller picture. Um, you know, sometimes these are close calls and uh, both sides can have uh, good arguments. Uh, so let us know what you think the best argument or best arguments, plural, are from the other side, and uh, uh, then try to rebut them uh, with, with uh, the evidence. So you know, for me, look at the facts, look at the law, and uh, hopefully uh, we can come out with some good policy decisions. But you know, also I would hope the FCC would not stray from its authority, um, uh, which it does uh, all too often in my view. I've made this argument for a long time. You know, the commission, the 96 Act was supposed to be pro-competitive and deregulatory. And in the Act, there are what are described as three primary tools. We have preemption, forbearance, and in very limited cases, sunset. And yet, going to your point, the FCC typically never then just exercises this, this authority. There's always some, you know, you, all of it's a classic example. Um, I forgot the exact quote you use when the you're spending a billion dollars on cable card. It was like the valley of unattained dreams, I believe, was the quote. You know, we're still going back. It was a great quote. We used it in, the, in our paper. Um, should the commission, can the commission be using more of its authority? Is it a problem because the statutes are ambiguous, or is it a lack of will? What, how can we be using the tool that Congress has at least given us, rather than increasing regulation, to try and trim down a lot of the regulatory underbrush so we can focus on the difficult decisions that we have to make? Well, it has to be a priority of the commission and uh, the leadership of the commission to do that. Uh, so if you're talking about from a minute to Section 10 forbearance, you know, depending on who's in charge, there might be a disincentive for uh, uh, industry to file forbearance petitions uh, because of the precedential value of, of those being shot down. Um, so uh, you, you've got to – it's really got to come from the, the leadership of, of, of the commission, and that starts in the chairman's office. Um, and to his credit, uh, Chairman Janikowski has uh, tried to uh, uh, to pare back some underbrush. Of course, I would like to see a lot more uh, cleared away. Um, but uh, in the context of, it's also not just the telecom context, but the context of media as well. So media ownership, we have Section 202H, uh, which really, I think, compels us to uh, deregulate as more uh, competition comes online, so to speak. And uh, certainly we have uh, much more competition in the media space than we did in 1996. Um, and we have to look at all the media, you know, audio and video uh, in, in all contexts uh, when we're looking at that, not just uh, traditional um, media. Uh, so it's just unfortunately got to come from commission leadership. And uh, while we are uh, an independent administrative agency, and there is a great deal of independence that comes with these jobs, um, which uh, makes uh, it a very, at least for me, a very liberating place to work because in terms of a job, it's it's extremely uh, liberating uh, having the, the insulation that we do. 
but at the same time, it depends on the personality of the person uh, in that seat uh, of, of the, each commissioner and of the, the chairman, uh, and then what uh, they're responding to uh, and what, what motivates them. Um, and that's uh, the sort of fascinating uh, organizational behavior dynamic of working at the FCC. I've seen a lot of uh, commissioners and chairmen uh, come and go just in my six and a half years, and uh, with each combination of personalities, um, that has produced some of the products we've seen over the years and explains a lot. All right, can, can I open up for a question too? Um, questions or two from the audience? Wake up, first of all. Yeah. That's right. Where are we going? Frustrated. The economics are frustrated. Sound sounds eroded. Uh, Commissioner McDowell, Baron Soka, Tech Freedom. We've been hearing here today all about the FCC, and there was a lot of discussion before you got here about net neutrality in the uh, DC Circuit case, which I'm, I'm sure you can't comment on. But I am curious to know uh, what your thoughts are on the FTC's role. Uh, it's a topic that doesn't get a lot of attention. Many people uh, forget that the FTC in 2007 issued a lengthy legal report explaining their position that they um, have had since Brand X full jurisdiction over broadband, both on consumer protection and on antitrust. There was some, uh, some debate this morning about uh, Trinco and whether that uh, ties their hands too narrowly, but I think there's also a good case to be made that uh, Trinco leaves them fully empowered to use antitrust laws to deal with uh, real abuses of, of market power, even if it precludes enforcing net neutrality as such. So I'm just curious, uh, what do you think about that option? Uh, what do you think about why it, it doesn't get more attention here? And, uh, and do you think it's in fact true that if, if the DC Circuit does strike down the open internet order, that, that there won't be a controlling legal authority? What, what, why isn't the FTC option uh, an adequate one. Excellent question. Um, and uh, I, I think there are ample laws already on the books that would uh, resolve uh, any issue that uh, net neutrality uh, proponents uh, fear. Uh, and I said so in my uh, dissent. Uh, so there are ample consumer protection laws and ample antitrust laws. Um, and uh, so if, uh, and it is and always has been, if broadband internet access is an information service, it's therefore not common carriage. Therefore, uh, FTC can uh, step in uh, as it could with any other consumer product or service uh, under consumer protection laws or its, uh, its uh, uh, flavor of uh, antitrust laws as well. Um, I'm not an antitrust expert. Everything I know about antitrust was taught to me by Jonathan Lee right here. So Jonathan, you want to raise your hand? So, and especially with Trinco. Uh, so as I understand, Trinco really only applies to, to common carriage as well, right? So. Uh, that um, I, I doubt Trinco really affects or undermines the FTC's ability to protect consumers should there be anti-competitive uh, conduct uh, in this space. So I think uh, consumer protection agencies, uh, class action lawyers, uh, lots of folks, government uh, regulators other than the FCC have lots of arrows in their quiver to protect consumers should an internet ser service provider uh, act in an anti-competitive way that harms consumers. Um, in the absence of any net neutrality regulations. And that's been part of the fallacy of the whole net neutrality debate. Um, and when you really you know, drill down and look at it, it's, uh, uh, as I've said many times before, in fact, I gave a, a speech uh, back in Rome, uh, thanks to you, actually, uh, so th this past summer, about regulating your rival. Um, and that's what I think uh, the net neutrality debate was really uh, mainly about, is please regulate my rival, but not me. Um, and if you look at a lot of uh, internet uh, companies, that were abdicating it are now maybe thinking twice. Um, because if you have uh, thousands of miles of fiber, you have servers and routers all over the world, you offer voice, video, and data services. Have I described AT&T, Verizon, Google, Amazon, all the above? Um, so with the stroke of a pen, you know, from an engineer's perspective, in other words, just to connect that dot, from an engineer's perspective, a lot of these companies look the same. Right, just the way I outlined it. So w there's just a, a, a small stroke of the pen needed to have a Google or an Amazon regulated as common carriage, either internationally through the ITU or uh, through the FCC. And uh, 
anyway, so back, that's, I got off topic, took the scenic route. But uh, I think that's something to think about when you're trying, you know, when there are advocates of this regulation uh, in this space. Um, let's think about the laws that already exist. Um, and consumer protection and antitrust laws, I think, are sufficient to protect consumers in this regard. Anybody else? Well, on that note, a um, couple quick administrative notes. First off, I'd like to thank my lovely wife, Lisa, who worked the door. Um, small family-run operation, so I want to thank her very much. Um, and I want to thank everybody here for coming down on a very cold uh, January 3rd. We really appreciate the excellent turnout. Uh, please uh, make sure you're on our mailing list and follow our work. This is going to be a very busy year. And so we thank you once again, and we look forward to seeing you probably in our next event, which will be our... Uh, we're going to probably do the cigar rooftop cigar event again. So thank you very much for coming, and um, Happy New Year.